Welcome, everybody. I'm really glad to be here in this very nice uh, venue. Um, uh, like the presenter said, I'm based in London, but uh, I also uh, work with the University of Coruña. I'm formerly I'm from the University of Coruña. I work with Amparo. And uh, back then, some years ago, we had this problem. So this uh, newspaper came to us and said, we have these logs, and we would like to know what's, what's going on. And I was sitting there on my computer, and I received all these files. And I was trying to get some insight, and, and the data set was not huge as we have today, but it was big enough for uh, me to be uh, sitting there in the computer waiting like hours for a result to come, and the hypothesis was wrong, and we had to go back. And he said, no, this is, this is not right. It has to be something out there. Uh, this is the time when big data was not a buzzword, so I just went to Google, and I found out this uh, Hadoop thing, and said, well, what's this? And uh, they said, oh, we can install this commodity hardware, and it will work. And if you just write the code or idea in a very specific way, and, you, and it will run in parallel, and you will have the result. So we had some computers there, and we said, yeah. So let's pick these computers, put it there, and reduce the time from hours to minutes, and that allow us to have uh, to test our hypothesis quicker and have a time a response time to the client, our, that our client back then, much quicker. So, what I'm telling this story uh, turns out what we were doing there was data science, but there was no word for that. I mean, we, this someone I don't know who invented this this word later. So what's data science is uh, do whatever you can to transform this raw data, which has no, makes no sense, in something that has some, carries some business value, something make me the next millionaire with my data. And uh, the important thing is uh, it is do whatever you can. Things move on, uh, move, move to London, and start talking about projects with people, and I always, once and again, find the same situation. You get the, the guy comes and says, I want to do data science, you know how to do data science, here you have some data. But usually the data is not prepared for doing any kind of task on it. The aim, the business value is not clear, the guy doesn't know what to do with it, so you actually don't know very much what to do with it. There's many books now about talking about these strategies, so you have to understand the context, the need, and the vision, then the outcome. But yeah, but and, and all these strategies make a lot of sense, but in the end someone has to go there and you know crack the code, build the algorithm, and uh, and move the data and combine the ideas to make the data make sense. So you go out for data science and maybe you are a more a Bayesian guy, maybe you like more neural networks, maybe you do unsupervised, maybe you, whatever. And, uh, but what actually happens is that many of these algorithms are built with some assumptions. They, are built, they were built in academia, so they are built with some assumptions. It's very specific. But now we're moving to many very different use cases. And in most of these use cases, the assumptions just don't match. Many of the times you don't have any kind of label, so supervised learning becomes problematic. Uh, you don't have any kind of prior knowledge. The person is coming to you, he doesn't know what, what, what it can be done or what he wants to do with it. Maybe you only want to do some exploration to give the guy the idea if there's some information there or not. Or, and many times the algorithms that you potentially would be able to use, they just don't scale because they were designed in a time where parallel distributed computing was not so important. So, Again, like in the Hadoop case some years ago, we ended up in an orphan situation. It's like we need something in our toolbox to face this kind of situation, right? We cannot just say, oh, we're going to try a lot of algorithms on top of it and let's see what happens. We have to need to have something that at least will kick off the use case. So well, I started talking uh, with my friends in UCL, my friend Leslie, he likes a lot graphs, and he said, hey, why don't we use a graph? So graphs are intuitive. Uh, they work as the human mind works. We work by association, so the kind of idea of a graph, it makes sense. When you are also going to explain the results, it's going to be very intuitive for the client, and he will say, hey, let's continue doing, doing things. When I mean graphs, I mean uh, building graphs where you connect things that are semantically uh, similar. And semantically is something, some abstract thing that we will see what, what, what's, what's the meaning of that. So think about a uh, graph where uh, you just connect two nodes uh, if they have something to do. Uh, so then we thought, so if we are going to do these graphs, uh, what would, if we had these graphs, what would, what would we be able to do if, uh, once we have them? So it turns out there is a lot of algorithms that probably will fit in many of your use cases that can be done. There are algorithms for 
for connected components, you can find isolated, isolated entities in your database. There are algorithms for detecting halves of information. There are some algorithms to infer information, and you can do many other tasks that we know about, like clustering, classification, anomaly detection, all those words. All those words can be done on graphs. So, let's, so we said, oh, so why, won't, why, won't, why don't we do it? Because in the end, actually, many of the most successful use cases nowadays, like social networks or web search, are also basically based on graphs. So what is this extra mile that makes graphs so, let's say, unpopular in, in many data science communities? Well, actually, in these very successful cases, what happens is that the graph is already done. It's explicitly. Let's think, for example, in a, in a, in a social network, the, the, the network of people following other people. This is given to you by, by the people. People are writing this graph. And uh, usually these graphs are highly sparse, so even if you have a, lot of, a big amount of nodes, you still are able to manage the graph. And it, 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 apart from being explicit, it also carries a lot of business value already in the information that you have in the graph. But what about the case when the graph is not explicit? So we have some raw data, there is no graph structure on top of it, but we have some kind of notion of how we could connect entities uh, based on, the, on that raw data. But we have to do this extra mile of building the graph. And it turns out that building the graph is a challenging problem. So if we think naive way, double loop, or you just you know, uh, have this HACC matrix and you divide in blocks and you transfer the blocks, it doesn't matter, whatever you do, I mean, building the graph in a naive way uh, doing all the similarities and then uh, maybe pruning is going to be a daunting, a daunting uh, task because it's a quadratic task and we still have facing problems when things are quadratic and dense. So as an example, if you have one million entities, let's say one million clients, doing the whole this calculation is bigger than the whole tweets in a year and probably seeing some foundation from the statistics, but I wasn't sure about that. So we need some wiser options. So is there any wiser option there? And it turns out that there is, but for some reason it hasn't gone as a blockbuster algorithms out there. Not many people know about them, but I think, the, I think this should change. So I'm only highlighting two ideas, two main ideas for building the graphs. Local, local sensitivity hashing and semantic hashing. And uh, the main idea, all of, all of them have the same idea. So when we think about a hash table, it, we're trying to avoid collisions. Okay, so this is the completely opposite. Uh, situation. We want to create a hash function in a way that if two things are similar, are going to collide. If I'm able to do that, I will be able to build the graph because I, don't, I won't uh, spend a lot of time doing wasteful computation. So, uh, as a graphic uh, local sensitivity hashing, you have a lot, of, no, a lot of points in your database and you organize it in hash tables, in a set of hash tables, in a way that similar things collide, then you have a query, you apply the same hash function, and you, get, you will end up in a bucket. And in that bucket, only a very small set of points would end up. And then you just filter by the points which are actually, can be some collisions, some spurious collisions, that uh, maybe they are not similar. You just, so you just then filter and get all those, uh, actually those points that you were looking for, the points that are similar to the query. A little bit of math, just a little bit of math. And, and, and that's it, we're done. Uh, so what's a, for doing this, you need uh, something which is called a local sensitivity hashing family of functions. What, uh, what have these functions? Uh, what, what is the property of these functions, the definition? So the definition is that if two things are very close, so they are closer, closer than a radius, the probability of collision is high. If things are very far apart, they are dissimilar, the probability, the probability of collision is low. And the effect just happens by a simple mathematical probability calculation. If I, have a if I have a family, I can sample independently functions from there, uh, and I just concatenate all of them, the probability of having a hash, it, it just reduces. But if P1, this probability of collision, if I'm similar, is high, this, uh, this reduction is not very significant. But for the points which are dissimilar, the probability P2 is much smaller, so you just reduce uh, the gap between similar things colliding and similar, dissimilar things colliding, the gap increases. So based on this strategy, you just build tables. There can be RDDs that can go to Cassandra or whatever, and then you will have all those buckets to find these similar things. So all these uh, 
finishes in an algorithm. Uh, well, this is one of the versions of local sensitivity hashing. There are many of them. So you build different hash tables, and then you just put all your data points in these different hash tables. And when you have a query, uh, you just calculate these hash functions again. By the way, these hash functions are usually very, very easy to, 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 to find. So for example, for Euclidean space, uh, these hash functions are uh, sampling for a standard multivariate Gaussian and doing the inner product. So it's a very cheap computation. And uh, so what can we do with these structures? So one of the things we can do is there are two flavors of what can we do. We can do randomized, see approximate nearest neighbor. It means that if there is a point close to me, uh, with high probability I'm going to get a point which is C times R closer to me. And if I do a little bit more of computation, uh, I can just find if there is a point closer to me, I will find that, that point with high probability. And the nice part about uh, this these, uh, these algorithms, they are proven to work uh, with high probability if you choose the, para the parameters well. So could you, you could imagine if you have this data structure uh, and you have bucket all the points already, uh, all the similar points already, building the subgraph is just uh, going through all this data, this data structure. But here, uh, the theory is still a bit in, in its infants. There are some uh, approaches of it. Uh, there was a paper in 2013. ECML has a very good, uh, has a very good approach to that. But it's feasible, and in practice, it works very well. It allows you to build a graph in a feasible time. But there is some caveats on this. On this. Uh, these uh, proofs and of bounds uh, can happen because uh, these uh, hashing functions are very tailored to, uh, to a metric. So, for example, Euclidean space, Hamming space, you need to have a, a definition of a metric. But sometimes this defining this metric of putting this, your problem in, in a metric is, is complicated. So you, it's difficult to encode. So what about if I cannot encode my problem in one of those metrics? So, so then comes the second major idea I see in this area, which is semantic hashing. It was introduced, uh, I think, by Hinton, 2006. The idea is we will build an encoder and a decoder in a neural network uh, in a way that the most inner layer is going to be a code, it's going to be a binary code. This is going to be our hashing. So the network is going to calculate the hashing. The whole broad idea of the, of, of the algorithm is that if we train a neural network in, in a way that is able to encode and decode the same information in the output, uh, the code in, in, in the inner layer is going to carry information about the data point. And we can use that. So it means that if I have two similar codes in that, in that output in the, in the inner layer, it means that those things are similar. So once you have this neural network trained, uh, you just uh, create a big hash table and you put again in buckets uh, things will have the same code produced by the network. The nice part about this idea is that then I don't need uh, a specific matrix. I, I, I made, uh, metric. I can just put my data in and allow the neural network to detect what are, this, what, what, the, what are two similar things and what are two dissimilar things. So what can we do if we have all these algorithms? So it turns out there is many, many, plenty of algorithms on top of it. Uh, I just won't highlight the ones that uh, happen to be the most useful for us in our use cases. First one is correlation clustering. Uh, it's a very nice idea introduced by Bloom uh, some years ago. Uh, so he reduced the clustering problem to a very specific situation, which is you have a graph and you, the graph is com uh, con uh, completely connected and you have a plus connection if two things are similar and a minus connection if two things are dissimilar. Uh, the objective function is if I divide a, a plus connection, a similar connection, then that's an error because those two things should be in the same group. If I group together two things that are connected by a negative, uh, by a negative uh, connection, it means that I'm making an error because those two things should be teared apart. Uh, of course, this, uh, although the definition, is, this is this kind of problems that the definition is very easy to say, but uh, in the end, they end up being NP-complete. A couple of reductions have been found that show that this problem is NP-complete. But the good news is that there are approximate algorithms that ha are, have worked very well for us in practice. Uh, so the one uh, we mostly use is the parallel version uh, found last year by Yahoo, with some Yahoo researchers. That is an extension of a pivot algorithm, which uh, um, uh, was proven to have a three approximation. So it means that it's only three times farther from the optima, that, that, than the optimal solution for any given graph, which is a remarkable 
uh, result for a such complicated situation or for such a simple uh, a simple process like this. So the, the algorithm basically finds randomly finds a, a pivot and it removes the subgraph around of, around it and uh, it just takes that as a cluster and it continues with the rest of the graph. So it's very easy to implement in Pregel. It's very easy to implement in any kind of the platform we have today. We can also do anomaly detection. So there are there is one algorithm calling, called local of life factor that has been overlooked for a while because it doesn't scale well. But if you combine this with the hashing, then it becomes feasible to apply to uh, big data sets. So it's a very quick uh, uh, solution to find anomalies in your data set, in, especially in inner cases, uh, in, in inner phases of projects. And of course, we could do KNN classified again. If we combine with this, uh, this can also have impact in scaling out uh, semi-supervised learning algorithms. We're having a look on that nowadays. But also, the most important thing, once you have a graph and you know the semantics of the edges, you can start to transfer information from connected nodes to other nodes. In a way, that's what recommender systems do. So, for example, there is a, this very nice paper uh, last year in uh, IQubo uh, 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 Big Data Conference where uh, these guys were able to geolocate people who didn't uh, geolocation um, with a median, uh, I think it was 60 or 80 kilometers uh, accuracy, just by minimizing that. Uh, so if I have these people I, and I connected in Twitter to these guys, um, uh, it means that probably I'm from the same area of these guys, so it just transfers information. So there is huge uh, inference uh, problems that can be simplified to a graph and apply algorithms like this. And there are many other algorithms I'm overlooking. So there is Blossom algorithm to find the best pairs in a graph, shorter paths, minimum cut search algorithms, bipartite graphs are also very useful. So w once you have put uh, together all these pieces, a lot of opportunities uh, emerge. So just to wrap up, Keep this recipe in your mind. So if you face some raw data, you could extract features uh, that are semantically meaning for you, construct a graph using this locality hashing, and once you have the graph built, you can navigate. For example, there is a stand of Neo4j there. You can put things in there and navigate them, do clustering, anomaly detection, inference. Many possibilities emerge. Thank you. <laughs>